This is the message for Moore's Chapel for Sunday, August 26, 2018, with guest speaker Dave Rosenblatt. Christianity, ritual, relationship, responsibility. Today's scripture reading is from Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Good morning. As you know, my name is Dave Rosenblatt, and this morning we're going to discuss an important topic, Christianity, ritual, relationship, responsibility. Would you play with pray would you play? Would you pray with me please? <laughs> Father God, we just thank you so much for a um, a wonder a, a wonderful day, a beautiful day, Lord. Uh, a country that we can freely worship you in, Lord. Um, an opportunity just to dig into your word, God. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would put me aside and just have your word touch somebody today and I pray that we would leave a little differently than we came here today. Amen. Well, as most of you know, if you haven't figured out in the past year, uh, I was raised Jewish. And uh, I'm more Chapel's token Jew, I think. And maybe the only one in Elkton, Maryland right now. There's not a whole lot of us. Um, I wasn't looking for church, honestly, when I first became a believer. During my childhood, I did protest participate in the Jewish High Holidays. Actually, read this. Sorry, in the Jewish high holidays, which were our Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish New Year, Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, and Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. How many people here remember August twenty fifth, nineteen seventy nine? Nobody. Me. Oh, Marty. Thanks. Um, I do. That was the day I got bar mitzvahed, and the one thing I remember, like it just happened was the sound of my 13-year-old cracking voice bouncing off the synagogue walls as I chanted my Torah portion that's part of the ceremony. And there was something holy and sacred about that moment. Even though it was an ancient Jewish ritual that my own father, grandfather, etc., had followed, there was something very holy about it. That moment had a purpose. It connected me to God. The dictionary defines a ritual as a religious or solemn ceremony consisting of a series of actions performed according to a prescribed order. Rituals serve a very distinct purpose. Our brains run our bodies, which is how our thoughts are manifested in the real world. Every action is born in thought. So I want everybody here to think about raising your hand. Okay, now raise your hand. Okay, your brain had to tell your body to do that. The high holidays in Judaism are reminders to our brain and then to our spirit what God did for us. When the law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, there was a very clear purpose for this. God's promise to Abram, who would later be called Abraham, was for descendants and land. But God told Abram that his descendants would be captive for 400 years until the sin of the Amorites reached its full measure. You see, the inhabitants of Canaan, which would become the future promised land, were sinning greatly, and God would later drive them out of the land. Guys, here's around 2 million people that have been taken captive for over 20 generations. That's longer than this country has existed. This is a people that had no cultural memory whatsoever. They only had verbal histories of their ancestors, of who God was, what practices were in their culture, and the promise made to their forefathers. They'd never seen any of this for themselves. They'd never witnessed it. Those food laws that sound funny, right? Those kept them safe from sickness and disease. Remember, they're in the desert for 40 years. There's no refrigerators. 
the cleanliness laws kept them healthy in the desert for that whole 40 years. They were coming out of a polytheistic, which means many gods, culture, little g gods, culture, from Egypt. The worship laws that they got showed them how to keep the one God in the forefront of their minds. When God sent Moses to rescue them, to continue the promise made to Abram, God wanted these people distinct, separate, and holy. They were to stand out and show the rest of the world what a relationship with God looks like. This is the purpose of rituals. Now, as Christians, sometimes we don't understand these, uh, some of these Jewish rituals, and I think they may get a bit of a bad rap. So originally, there was only one commandment. Do you remember what it was way back in the garden? Anybody? Don't eat that. <laughs> that one thing, don't eat that, right? We didn't listen. So then there were ten. Four that showed us how to love God, and six that showed us how to love each other. With a show of hands, who here thinks we don't have to follow the Ten Commandments since we now have a relationship with Jesus? Who thinks we do? Not the uh, response I was expecting, but that's awesome. So we continue. We have rituals in Christianity as well. First and foremost, while here on earth as a human, Jesus was a teacher, a rabbi. When asked what the most important commandment was, he replied in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So he's saying the rest of the entire Jewish Bible was pivoted on those two commandments, which is really, he's telling us to keep all ten. If we follow those two, we keep them all. If Jesus didn't want, him, want us to follow them, would he have answered in that way? I, I don't think so. The purpose of the ritual of baptism in the Old Testament was originally twofold. First was for a rabbi to ritually cleanse himself before going into the Holy of Holies. And second, to ritually cleanse others of their sins. And these were usually converts to Judaism. Jesus himself was baptized. We continue this ritual of baptism as commanded in Matthew 28, 19. Baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The purpose of the ritual of communion was tied back to Passover. Bread is crucial to life. Juice, they used wine in Jesus' time, contains vitamin C, necessary for life. If you don't have vitamin C, your body will break down. It's necessary for life and it's not found in bread. I actually didn't realize that till I was doing some research for the sermon. Those two things together will sustain life. But the point is Passover commemorates the release of the Hebrew people from captivity. The bread reminds us that we ran from slavery and the dough didn't have time to rise. That's why matzo or unleavened bread is flat. Wine commemorates freedom. So the bread and the juice represent running from slavery to freedom. So when Jesus said, remember me, it was a huge shift from the way they had lived, righteousness by means of the law, to the way of living through Jesus, which is righteousness by gr faith, by grace, not from the works of the law. Does that mean that the law is bad? Absolutely not. As Paul says in Romans 7, 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would have not known what sin was had it not been for the law. For what I would have not known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. So Paul is basically telling us that without the distinction of the law, we wouldn't know what sin is. There's no left without a distinction of right. 
There's no darkness without the distinction of light. But the law by itself is insufficient. Paul continues in Romans, however, to, to explain that the law is insufficient to make him righteous. Rather, he explains how now that he knows about how sinful he is, there's no way he can be righteous, not by himself. He's painfully aware of how unrighteous he is. Has anyone here gone over the speed limit recently? Anybody? How about on the way here? Okay, right? Anyone not stop completely at a stop sign in the past week? Okay, be on, be on, on me a bunch. You're all lawbreakers, everyone in, me too. But thanks to Jesus, we're made righteous. Ritual is good when it helps us remember we're all part of God's story and takes us into his presence. But ritual is not good when it becomes rote and empty, just going through the motions. That's not what it was intended for. So now we shift from ritual to relationship. Several years ago, Lori and I participated in the Disciple One Bible Study. Anybody here ever seen that or heard of that? I know a lot of you have the big red book, right? A friend of ours, Jess, really made me laugh. She said, you know, I really like the God of the New Testament instead of the Old Testament. In Old Testament times, he was full of wrath and they only did sacrifices. The New Testament God is about love and he doesn't require us to follow all those laws anymore. So I was a new Christian at the time, but even then I knew that Malachi said, I, the Lord, do not change. So to dispel another misnomer about Judaism, only being about sacrifices, we only need to turn to Isaiah 1, verse 11, which says, a multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. After being found guilty of adultery with Bathsheba, King David prays to God in Psalm 51, verse 17. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. So both the Old and New Testaments point to both ritual as well as relationship as being important to God. So Jesus did not come to this earth to create another religion, and he didn't create Christianity. He came here for a specific purpose. As Luke observes in Luke 19, verse 10, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. He came to show people the way to a relationship with God through him. John chapter 14, verse 6 reminds us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him, but it doesn't stop there. Relationship's very important, but if all we ever do, as James tells us, is tell people to go in peace and be warm and well-fed, but does nothing for them, our faith is empty and meaningless. Jesus did not say just to believe in me, but to follow me, live as he did, and be his hands and feet here on earth. Disciples followed rabbis after going through rigorous Jewish schooling so they could learn how the rabbi interpreted scripture. That's where the term taking the yoke came from. When Jesus said, my, my burden is, my yoke is light, and my burden is easy. That's taking the yoke. That's not what happened with Jesus. Not only did he come to seek and save the lost, he came with an assignment for others to do the same. As we read in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. He wasn't just their rabbi. He didn't just teach them. He lived life with them. 
ate with them, traveled with them, communed with them. He called them his friends. He didn't just say, let me teach you a bunch of stuff about how to do Jewish stuff and interpret the law that you should already have learned in Hebrew school. But he also didn't say, let me make your lives easier by having a relationship with God through me. From the very beginning of his ministry, he told them he was going to give them a responsibility. He was going to send them out to fish for people. He instructs us to do the same. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20, he told his disciples, his Talmudim, to therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Any sports fans here? I know there's a bunch, right? So a fan watches the game. I might even participate in the rituals, you know, the clown wigs and the face and body paint and all that stuff, right? A spectator, a follower of the game, wants to know as much about the game as they can. But players are actively engaged in the game and the mission of the team. A Talmud, a disciple, not only wants to know what the teacher knows, but wants to be what the teacher is. The AA responsibility statement says, I am responsible when anyone, anywhere, reaches out for help. I want the hand of AA always to be there. And for that, I am responsible. Discipleship is not the same thing as being a follower of Jesus. It's not bad to be a follower of Jesus. Please don't hear that. But discipleship is not the same as being a follower. Intentional discipleship is about being intentional, being responsible, about fulfilling Jesus' commandment. So what about us? Are we Jesus fans, Christian spectators, or disciples of Jesus, active in the life game of Christianity? Now, again, let's not beat up on ourselves. I don't want you to hear this as, as condemnation. It's not. But it's a really great opportunity to check in where we are in a Christian journey, wherever that may be. Romans chapter 1 reminds us there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Wherever you are in your journey is totally fine. But let's also remember that Christianity is a team sport. It's not meant to do alone. And it's a marathon, not a sprint. We're meant to do this together, guys. So ask, go ahead, ask me how. I'm glad you asked. We have another great opportunity to take the relationship we got, that we have, right? Through inviting Jesus into our hearts and fulfilling on the responsibility of discipleship with our upcoming Journey of Faith experience in October. The weekend is an awesome opportunity, not only for us to experience the journey of Christianity for ourselves, but to invite someone else to church for us all to experience God's unstoppable love for us. Make a friend, be a friend, and bring a friend to Christ. It's about all three, ritual, relationship, and responsibility. But let's make sure we take the rituals out of the pews and the relationship outside the building. I think it's awesome that we're having an outside service by a, by a lake, a pond. Let's continue to take the relationship outside the building and take Jesus' responsibility to heart, to a lost and broken world that desperately needs to experience Jesus and his love on a journey of faith. That's what Christianity is all about. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much, Jesus, for an opportunity to be your hands and feet to a lost and hurting world, Lord. Lord, we pray that um, something that 
gets shared or felt or experienced today, Lord, is something that we would take in our relationship with Christ and pass along to others. God, I thank you for an opportunity just to be your hands and feet today. We thank you, and we praise you, and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to The Message. We are located at 392 Blake Road, off Blue Ball Road in Elkton, Maryland. Service times are 8.30 and 11 a.m. For more information, please visit www.morschapel.org.